Are you ready? Sea of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. Well, what's old is new again. As we all know, the Calgary Flames have rehired Daryl Sutter as their head coach. But before we get to that, we got to talk about the week that was and the week that led to that. As always, I'm Dan, alongside a very ecstatic Matt. Uh, Matt, before we get into your th- Sutter thoughts, let's talk about this week, shall we? Yeah, well, it, it was a rather uneventful week. What can we say? On uh, Monday, Calgary played Ottawa in the last of the series in Ottawa. That was... Uh, a Ottawa 5-1 win over the Flames, and these are not... It's weird. Ottawa's been beaten and getting lots of goals against some good teams, and so it's not just Calgary, but this is another one where Ottawa looked like they came out ready to play and Calgary didn't. Um, Ward took an early timeout after the second goal in that one. It looked like he was reading the team the riot act, but the Flames just looked really disorganized in the first and second period, and I think that's what did them in. Yeah, Calgary... Uh, for a large portion of the season just does not seem to be able to have any cohesive method of attacking the opposition and like you see flashes of it like where when things actually do work that it's there it's just that for whatever reason like everybody's not on the same page and in this game you it was just blatantly clear like everybody was on their own page and like turnovers led to goals against um, it just was not a cohesive effort whatsoever and it's understandable that Ward was annoyed like especially after the second goal it's like come on guys like you know this is an important game and you know like Ottawa in Both lot, sides knew it was important, and it felt like Ottawa anteed up and Calgary didn't. Yeah, you, you have to think of, like, Ottawa as kind of like the young gun era of Flames. Like, they don't have a lot of talent, but they try. And if you're you're not trying, then they'll take advantage of you. And they do have enough talent where they can score. It's just that they don't have very much. Otherwise, they might actually do something. <laughs> but um, it's one of those situations Calgary did not put any effort in and Ottawa took advantage of it and they took advantage of every opportunity that Calgary gave them very willingly and you know skated to an easy 5-1 win yeah it it felt like in this game it was almost like a pickup hockey game for the Flames I know when I played pickup there's no real system everybody just goes out and does whatever they do best and that's what it seemed like the Flames were doing here every guy was playing their own game and there seemed to be no team structure even team strategy going on yeah it's just oh we're playing a game yay oh we're down oh well who cares you know, and that, and this is what we often see from the team is they get down and they just fold up and go home. Yeah, and like this whole season has been just perplexing, frankly, because like talent wise, this team should not be as bad as they are, and it's just effort and mental discipline and the lack thereof, which led, you know, in a large reason for what happened this week. Before we talk about that, I know you're excited. Let's get through the next two games. The uh, The next game of the week, the Calgary Flames came home after their long road trip on Thursday and played against Ottawa once again. This time with a better result. Calgary ended up winning this one 7-3 to against the Senators. And uh, Dubé got his first career hat trick. Um, it was funny because there's nobody in the stands, but I don't know if you noticed it, but Markstrom, who was on the bench, tossed his hat on the ice, so at least there's one hat for Dubé. Oh, that's good. Um, and still some defensive problems in this one I think the Flames need to tighten up on, but obviously there's lots there to build on offensively. Yeah, it, this team, when the, their talent is actually clicking, seven goals, yeah, that's no big deal. Like, they can do that, and they have that in them. It's the lack of cohesive effort on... Even, like, the fact that Ottawa scored three goals, like, if they were playing more sound positionally and not, you know, wandering a bit defensively, the, then, you know, I don't know if Ottawa even gets a goal in this game. But, 
uh, you know, again, like Calgary, if they their offense hadn't been firing on all cylinders, they could have easily let this one go away too. You know, it's probably not a good thing for me to say, but after the Dubé goal in the second, and when the second ended and Calgary was up 5-1, I was sitting there watching going, how are they going to mess this up? Like, I just had this feeling that Calgary is going to blow a 5-1 lead. Yeah, that... That, oddly enough, I was watching the game as well, and I had the exact thought at the same time. Of, and then when Anisimov you know, scored the second, I'm like, okay, here it goes. Uh, yeah, and this is Chicago back, like, t- that one I referenced in the last episode, like, oh, and we're going to lose <laughs> before we even like get to it overtime. Just, it, it just shows, I think, the inconsistency of this team, that normally when you're up 5-1, you've got it, but the fact that you and I were both sitting there after the second going, okay, how are they going to lose this? Like, yeah. it just... It it's sort of the play to the Calgary Flames. Yeah, and it's hard to trust in the players themselves when like the effort levels are just so sporadic uh, from shift to shift, period to period, game to game, where you literally have no clue what you're getting at any given second, and like it, it's frustrating because of the fact that. Like, it's not like Calgary's being held back by, like, oh, they're missing four of their key players. Or, you know, like a whole bunch of different Some nights it sure feels like they are. Well, frankly, it feels like they're playing the Calgary Hitman as the, fl- you know, hey, you can wear the Flames jerseys instead, you know. And, yeah, like, just not very good. And, frankly, at times, it, I honestly think that the Hitman would be playing better than... <laughs> you got two other choices. You can get the Hitmen or the Heat. They're both uh, they're on the same arena. Yeah. Speaking of the Heat, I just want to give some praise to Adam Rajitska for leading the entire AHL in scoring. Keep it up. They've they've had a good week. We'll talk more about them next week. I wanted to give them some time to get their season going. Um, well, after this game where the Calgary Flames won seven to three, um, a big win. The thing you don't expect to happen after a big win happened, and they said, Jeff Ward, good job with the win. Get, get out. And the Calgary Flames uh, dismissed their head coach, Jeff Ward, and brought in Daryl Sutter. And we, we won't talk about it quite yet, Matt. We'll uh, spend some dedicated time on that. But um, Calgary brought in Daryl Sutter after this game, or announced they were. He hasn't arrived yet. He's expected to be ready to join the team on Monday um, after some COVID protocol, but they had one more game to get through before he got there, and that was the Saturday Night Hockey Night in Canada game against the Oilers. And the Flames were up; they were up in the third. They were up uh, for most of the, or I wouldn't, yeah, I would say they're they're up for most of the game. Pooley Arvey tied it, and they got up again. And uh, the Oilers broke the the tie late in the second with uh, 3:45 left. This was uh, assistant Ryan Huska's time to shine behind the bench. He was acting as head coach in this game. Matt, I think that just like, I mean, the last Edmonton game, Calgary really got lit up on the score sheet, but I think that game, like this game, it's really, you know, the Flames did okay against the Oilers. They didn't do well against Connor McDavid. Um, I actually have to, I think this is going to be a first in the entire history of our show. I have to credit the Edmonton Oilers for playing a good hockey game. They definitely played well, and you definitely saw the Flames. You definitely saw the Flames play a different style in this one too. It felt like old school Battle of Alberta, but I just I didn't feel like I don't know. I, I felt like the Oilers were just more playing. I don't know how to describe it. I didn't feel they were a better team than they usually are, but I still didn't feel like they were a cohesive unit. No, um, how would you say with the Oilers? You have to expect that. Okay, the Flames have been bad. They fire their coach, they get a guy who's got a reputation for, you know, Daryl Sutter. You know, like, it, it, it speaks for himself. You know that the team is going to be coming out firing at you and throwing everything, and you're just, you have to endure it. And to the Oilers' credit, yeah, the Flames had 22 shots or whatever in the first period. They only gave up one goal. Yeah, the uh, there was a couple of fights. The Neal fight with uh, Kachuk and Lucic with Nurse. And, you know, Calgary came out, played a physical game. It was a lot more intense. But the Oilers are like, okay, yeah, you know, you're, you've are you got this pent-up energy. that That's nice. We'll just hang in there. And they lulled the Flames to sleep. And the Flames went to bed. 
and then they won. So, you know... It, yeah, I, I wouldn't say the others played well, though. I said the no, others had... Um, I think the Flames took their eye off the ball a little bit with the uh, with the uh, the gritty game, and I think they were out there trying to maybe be more gritty than they are. And I think they they took their eye off the ball, and the others capitalized. But I wouldn't it, say this is exactly. a great Oilers game. Oh no, not not at all. But it was it, still McDavid that I mean, you know, I would say it was still McDavid and friends in this one. Oh, for sure. But the, in terms of like the tenor of the team, like they weathered the storm at the right times, and then attacked opportunistically when they could and they got the two points and they did a good enough job to just let Calgary burn themselves out and then walk all over them when it mattered and Calgary didn't have a response the third period was uh, atrocious frankly for the Flames like they did score early, but like there was absolutely no pushback when Yamamoto as, scored. As soon as Yamamoto scored, you could feel the momentum shift. Yeah, and it was game over from that point on. Uh, I was as I was watching it, it's just like, okay, when's the goal coming? When's the goal coming? Come on, it's gonna happen. And McDavid scores. Okay, game's over. Yeah, thank you. You know, like it was predictable, and yeah. You know, couple notes in this one. Uh, second goal for the Flames came from Noah Hannafin. His first goal in 45 games. As well, Derek Ryan back in the lineup and Jacob Markstrom in after uh, Riddick started six in a row. So good to kind of have the complete team going again. And you and I have talked about it. Hannafin has looked great this year. Just hasn't got on the score sheet. So I thought it was good that Noah finally got rewarded in this one. Yeah, and I think that like he seems that if now that one's gone in, I think you might see a few more because he's had plenty of opportunities, it just none of them have clicked. I think that this might just be one of those situations where, like, now he'll go on a bit of a run for a bit. I think you're probably right. So with that, uh, with with that last game talked about, and now the Flames moving into the next week of hockey, we have 25 games under our belt, and we sit six in the Scotia North Division. Above us, Toronto, Winnipeg, Edmonton, and Montreal. Calgary has 24 points. The next is Montreal with 28. We're now tied with Vancouver. So, I mean, next week's the halfway point because 28, yeah, 20 games will be halfway. So we are still outside the playoffs looking in at this point with, I would say, some ground to make up. Oh, very much so. And, like, if this was any other of the divisions, it would be literally which of the top 10 players in the draft are we getting? Because they're, they, you look at Dallas, they they struggled early because of COVID and that, and they're so far behind the the four playoff teams that like there's no realistic way that Dallas can make that up. Well, I mean, and, if we just do the math, we're at 24 points. So in the Discover Central Division, the fourth place team, Chicago's at 31. Uh, in the Mass Mutual East, the fourth place team's at 27. That's Philadelphia. And the Honda West Division, the fourth place team's 27. So we'd be out in every division. Yeah, and. Even though, um, like, those teams, like, we'd only be a couple of points back, it just the nature and makeup of the other teams that are in the playoffs, it would be a lot harder than our division. Because, frankly, Winnipeg, Edmonton, and Montreal do have more holes than a whole bunch of the teams in the other divisions. So Calgary is in a beneficial spot because of that. But you can't get complacent because, oh, the other teams are not as good. You know, and Calgary, I think, for many years, really, have played to the level of, or below of their opponents. And, like, yeah, talent-wise, this team is the second best and most complete team in the division. But you actually have to put the effort into play and they, they haven't at all this season and there there's a reason why they're at the basement like it, it, frankly if it wasn't for jacob markstrom the, i think that the flames would be the 31st place team in the nhl so you know it is what it is like the this team needs to s figure things out and that's why uh, jeff ward was let go and frankly like, I don't have anything against Ward. Like, it's one of those situations where, like, his system could have worked if with 
a team that didn't seem to have a whole litany of off-ice issues. And I think that the off-ice issues were what caused the problems on the on-ice aspect of it. And just the simple lack of preparation from the entire team. Well, let's get into that. We need Michael Buffer here to tell us it's time for the main event. Is uh, that we- Daryl Sutter's music? <laughs> As as we mentioned, on Thursday the 4th, right after the game, the Calgary Flames announced that they had relieved Jeff Ward from his uh, position as head coach. And the new head coach was Daryl Sutter. Daryl Sutter, last coach for the Flames from, well, I guess, his first stint here, 2002 to 2006. He was also general manager from 2003 to 2010. After uh, his time as the Flames GM, he left, went to a few other markets, as we all know, um, he went to, well, I guess L.A. was the only other market afterwards, but he was in a few other markets before that, Chicago um, and San Jose. And, yeah, he was Calgary and L.A. where he won two cups, and now he's back. Yeah. Uh, he was doing some consulting work with Anaheim this past season as well. But Yeah, I, it, I mean, he wasn't behind a bench, though. No, it was just consulting, but, yeah. I want to know what a coach consultant does. Teach the other coaches how to coach? <laughs> I don't know. So, Matt, you've been calling for this for a couple of years now. We have a famous episode, so one of our most listened to, where you kind of freaked out and uh, and went on a Daryl Sutter ty- try- ty- tirade. So here you go. Well, the thing is, is that, you know, it's not because Daryl uh, coached the Flames previously. Like, that, it, it, I just, when you look at how teams are run, like if Tortorella was available... I would have been including him, but he wasn't. Um, just the nature of which he holds players accountable, yet works with them and teaches them is something that is different. And he's one of the better actual teachers of how to play the game the right way. And you saw that when he first came to Calgary. Uh, like the flames were not a very talented team and in some aspects like he did fill out at that trade deadline with a lot of depth guys like Nima Nelson, Simon, etc. but he taught a guy like Robin Regeer how to actually use his frame properly to cuz Regeer was not a very good defenseman until Daryl Sutter and like, there was flashes, but he wasn't the Regeer Regeer that we got to know after that. And I I find that, like, this team, because they're all over the map, and, like, nobody's pulling in the same direction, everybody's just, you have 20 individuals, not a team. And, like, this is, when Calgary previously, in, like, the late later part of Aginla's term, they struggled because, like, they had a lot of talent, but not any cohesive direction. This unit is also in that same mold of, you have all the parts that you could use to actually build a winning franchise, and we saw that two years ago where they put up 107 points, but they're just not doing anything in the right manner, and Daryl's very good at holding players accountable without being a ridiculous person like uh, Babcock or some of the other types were, and holds the players accountable to each other in a way that I th- I feel that like nobody has any accountability at all other than to themselves, and like you see like Matthew Kachuk. It, you know, his teammates jumping on him earlier this season for his intensity, and yet that's the right way to play, and I think that uh, Daryl will be able to sort out those issues in a way that uh, to both get the team playing the right way and playing the right way, which is not has not been really present since he was the coach last. Daryl Sutter comes in with an old-school approach, and he's really more known, he, like you said, he's in a Tortorella-type vein of being more of a disciplinarian-type coach. And he knows how to motivate players, and he wants one thing. 
He wants to win. And I think that the big reason they're bringing him in is we all know the changes have to be made. You and I have talked about it a lot. We have to make changes in the offseason. We have to make some moves uh, to this core. And I think the question is, who can be better and who can't? And I think Daryl's being brought in to figure out who wants to do this and who can work hard versus who can't work hard and we need to find a new home for. Yeah. So, so many guys, So many times guys want to be more gentle on their team because they want to you know get a job after they want to be liked. i don't think daryl cares anymore he's retired no. he'll go back to being retired after this so he doesn't care if you're his friend he doesn't care if he gets another job he's going to come in for one reason and one reason only and he said it he's got unfinished business here to win the stanley cup so you're either with him or they'll find a new home for you in the off season yeah and for, like this was like a couple weeks ago where it's like if you're not wanting and committed to actually winning here then pack your stuff and get out and Daryl very much is like is going to be the sorting hat from Harry Potter, where you know, <laughs> figure out what parts you know each of these players fall into, and either on ice in the press box or three doors down in the Stockton dressing room. Yeah, or you know, we're shipping you to Edmonton. <laughs> well, and I and I don't think we're gonna see moves this year, just because no. you and I have talked about the logistics of it. But I think it's compiling a list for tree of. Who do you move when the season's over? Yeah, exactly. And, like, there, there's only so much that you can do right this second, and none of them make any sense. Like, you, you'd even take a team like the Buffalo Sabres, who are struggling mightily with Eichel, Hall, and uh, Jeff Skinner. They can't do really anything right now to fix their problems. So, you know, Calgary, I think, in a large part is, you know, like... To me, this season is kind of a write-off in terms of, like, they've been so bad to this point that if they do anything from this point forward, it's a bonus more so than expectations of, oh, th this team should be a conference final team. Like, what our, you know, e expectations were heading into this season. Like, th things have gone that awry where anything that does turn out in a positive is a good thing but should be looked at more as a bonus than anything and you know it's like you said it's a chance to sort out the players right it's yeah a, i mean daryl wants to get to the playoffs and i think you and i have talked about it too the window of opportunity on this core is closing i think they need to figure out what changes to make in the off season i think they have to make that run next year there's no ifs ands or buts about it if you want to keep this core together so this is daryl's time to come in motivate these guys figure out who he can do this with and who needs to be replaced and then they got to run for it next year yeah and by the way, as a separate aside, if anybody is going to unlock the potential of Sam Bennett and make him into the player that he had the potential to be, it would be Daryl Sutter because it there are enough parts to his game. It he he could fix him. I think this could go either way, though, Matt. I oh yeah, if, I agree. If 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 uh, Bennett plays like he has in the last month, I think he and Daryl will get along really well. If he starts taking dumb penalties like he has for every other season, he's going to be in the press box real fast. Yeah, and I think that, like, uh, if anybody is applauding this change, I think it would be Sam Bennett, just due to the fact that. Yeah, Sutter's going to be hard on him, but he's extremely fair, too, and is not going to pull punches. So, you know, if Bennett needs to be better, the, he'll tell him, not only do you need to be better, but here's how you be better, and listen to me. So, You've talked in the past about how teammates allegedly told Matthew Kachuk to tone things down. I think Bennett and Kachuk are both going to be able to play their games with Daryl here. Yeah, well, like... A couple weeks ago, like I said, like the management needs to send a clear message to Kachuk, like this is your team, you know, and like that group of players because, you know, like you you guys are doing things the right way, and I think that like this is definitely, uh, yeah, the you know Kachuk, Lucic, Lindholm, Bennett, um, Tanev. Like, those guys, you saw in the Oilers game, like, all of those guys were noticeable in that game. And for the positive and right reasons, and I think... You would have thought Darrow was on the bench in that first period, just the way they were playing. Yeah, and it, it's one of those things that if the rest of the team can 
play more in that vein, that things will be okay and they will work themselves out. It's I I think that also part of the problem is that the flames themselves do not understand how to pace themselves properly as well. Because at times I I find that like they put too much effort like in the first period and then they have nothing left in the gas tank in the second and third and you know finding that right balance but I think that's a you know coaching Sutter will fix that kind of thing the other thing I don't think Daryl's gonna do and there's been a lot of talk about this in the past not just in Calgary but in a lot of places is does your salary dictate your ice time and I think that if anybody's gonna sit down some of these players like uh, Monaghan like, um, you know, whoever else may be on the top group is not performing. I think I could totally see Daryl trying to make a point and sitting those guys down for a period or two. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, you know, if you're not playing the right way. And, like, I, I know I've heard some people like, oh, well, how is he going to get along with Johnny Gaudreau? Um, perfectly fine. Like, if Gaudreau plays his game his way and does things in his game the way that he needs to, you know, like you're not going to expect a draw to go and hit people. Like, come on. He's a skill guy. He's a flash guy. As long as he's doing the skill guy, flash guy thing that he does, there won't be a problem. It's when if he, he disappears like he did last year, that Daryl's going to have an issue. Exactly. You know, like you're the best player in terms of just raw offensive skill. Go do that. And there won't be a problem. And, and we we know what to expect from Daryl Sutter, like you were saying, the hitting, the sort of quote-unquote Western Canadian-style hockey. But I think that the game has changed a lot, too, since Daryl was in it last. And I think Daryl's a smart enough coach to realize he can't just come in and run this team like he did, you know, in 04. And he's smart enough to know these players, understand who they are, and I really don't think he's going to come into the system. I think a lot of it's going to be, sort of like you said, just guys, play the way, I think, for the first couple games, you be you. Show me who you are. And and let me see what we've got. You look at like when the Flames have been successful more recently. Like Bob Hartley designed the system around what he had, and that's mm -hmm. why in fourteen fifteen they had such success because you had a lot of fast guys that could generate a lot of sh scoring opportunities off the rush, and they were a very good counter puncher type team. It. Bill Peters, it was very much uh, build it around the team. Where um, Jeff Ward, it was more, you know, you play to the system and it didn't work. Or Gullitson, play to the system and it didn't work. And Daryl's very much in that, well, th these are the horses I have. I'll figure out how to tweak things. You know, and thankfully, like, Calgary does have a lot of physical guys that can throw the body around. So you can kind of get that those elements of Sutter hockey without, like, everybody, oh, hey, Monaghan, go hit, like, eight people. Like, that's just not his in him to do that. But There's enough guys that we can put one sort of... I think if Daryl wants to, we can put one um, checker on every line if he wants to add some grit to his whole lineup. Yeah, exactly. And, like, one of the hallmarks of... Sutter's teams, whether it was Calgary, L.A., San Jose, skating with pace and getting in on guys. And, like, it doesn't matter if you're finishing the check, just being in on the defenders or defensively in on the attacking guys and make them make the play. Like, if a guy makes an awesome play and beats you and they score, great. Good for you. You know, you did an awesome thing. But make them earn it. And not, oh, well, hey, here's the slot. Walk right in. You know, and you, we've been seeing a lot of that this season where, you know, teams are getting way too good of opportunities where if you're just paying attention to details. I think more than the offensive stuff, Daryl Sutter's teams are known to be hard to play against, and that's what the Calgary Flames have to be. Yeah, and it, it's just none of this wishy-washy, like... You know, like, uh, Daryl's teams always have been, like, you're playing as five-man units. Like, if you get beat, that's fine. But, you know, like, everybody on the ice is responsible because you as a group weren't doing what you needed to. It's not, oh, so-and-so lost his man, 
And so, oh, it's his fault. It, everybody works together in his systems. And, you know, it, it, you even saw a little bit of that kind of a theme in the first period where, like, the team seemed to be a little bit tighter in the first, like, five to eight minutes defensively than they normally have been. And that's more indicative of how Daryl's teams play. I can very much see Daryl Sutter going back to, let's call them last year's lines, the Goudreau, Monaghan, Lindholm, Kachuk, Backlund, Dubé, um, or sorry, Kachuk, Backlund, Monjapani, Lucic, Bennett, Dubé, just for a game or two, because I think those, those are the lines that have given us the best success. Yeah. And then from there, decide what he wants to do. And as you and I talked about last week, is Lindholm a center? Is Lindholm a right wing? But I think you go back to the lines that have had the most success and observe them from there. Yeah, and you also have to be able to evaluate. It, it's different, like, if you're lo- watching on TV versus l- live, being able to determine exactly how things fit, and you might be able to discern that, oh, well, maybe this might work better instead, just based on the feel of the players on the ice and all that. So, I agree. Go with the recipe that makes the most sense, and then figure things out from there. And while Daryl Sutter has never worked with um, you know a lot of this coaching staff, there's two very familiar faces: Marty Jelena, who's on the bench, and Craig Conroy, who's up in the uh, office. And I think that you'll see Sutter rely very heavily on those guys, two players they coached here, two guys that I have to assume he trusts. And some of those questions, like you were saying, I can see you asking, you know, Connie and Jelena of you know what's worked, what hasn't, who, you know, who needs more time, who needs less time, not necessarily do what they. Tell him, but use those guys for his meter stick. Yeah, and go from there and read the situation on the fly. And, like, oh, if, say, like, uh, Bennett needs more time, then give it to him and see. And well, I think whatever. By this t- I think by this time next week, you'll probably see Bennett playing uh, with Johnny and, and Monty. Uh, I would assume so, too. I think even if just for one game, I think... Sutter's going to want to test him out there and see what he's got and and almost make it Sam's job to lose. Yeah. Well, there's two players on the team that I think will benefit the most from Daryl. One's Sam Bennett and the other's Oliver Shillington. Because Shillington, he has those instincts, that, that those good offensive instincts, and I think that, again, like if anybody can get the most out of... I you know Daryl definitely would be, and it'll be interesting to see you know because ultimately the Flames team is still a very young team. Like even guys like Gaudreau and Monahan, like they're still only like twenty six, twenty five. Like they're not old veteran veteran players. Like they're still on the young side and teachable. And I think that you know if you can get them. Like, frankly, Aginlo was older than those guys were when Daryl came aboard. And, you know, so... It's one of those situations where Calgary can... If they're... The players if they are, want to be taught, this is the guy that's going to teach them. If exactly. they want to change, this is the guy that's going to get change out of them. And I think it's also the guy that if you don't want to change, it's going to be evident very quickly. Yeah, exactly. And it's like... What is your point of playing hockey if you're not wanting a Stanley Cup? Like, you know. Like the check. Exactly. And that's fine if that's your response of, oh, I'm here for the paycheck. You can go do that and get paid by somebody else, and we, we can get some people in that actually care and want to actually win. Because, like, uh, uh, there was an old quote of uh, Daryl's that, like, if he had 20 players like Jason Weimer, that the Flames would win the Stanley Cup. The, the, the point there is the work ethic and attitude, not the talent, because, you know, come on. Yeah. <laughs> but, but when you look at that whole 04 roster, I mean, it was because, and I know Weimer wasn't necessarily there at the time, but, I mean... That whole roster worked hard. That's why they made it to the finals. It wasn't because they were the best, most skilled team in the league. They certainly were not. No, they they had a lot of fast guys that h- skated hard. They were in on everything all the time, and they were just relentless. And they cared, and they were all pulling in that same direction. And I think that, you know, like, and it's perfectly fine, like, if certain players don't, 
fit that situation, and you can relocate them. Uh, but, you know, the f key thing is is that this contract for Sutter is not a one-year deal, but a three-year deal, which is longer than everybody other than Monaghan. And so, like, this is a clear sign, like, he's here longer than you guys are, really. You know, so... We'll come back to that. I just want to go back to your topic earlier about who you think will do well with Sutter. Um, it's interesting that you say Shillington because on the back end, I think Hannafin's going to excel. I think, oh, like same you here. Were saying, like you were saying, Hannafin has that offensive side, but he also can be very defensive. And I think Daryl's going to help him figure out the right balance between the two. And I've said to you before, I think that Hannafin was brought in to be the heir apparent to Giordano as Giordano started to age. Yeah. And I think if anyone's going to get that out of Hannafin, it's going to be Daryl. I think all Darryl's four, going to help. Frankly, all four of the young defensemen that the Flames have, like, it's just like Jordan Leopold when uh, the Flames first got him. Like, he was kind of a wishy wash. He, he was a there. Like, he wasn't great by any stretch. Daryl molded him into a top pairing defenseman, and he was legitimately a top pairing defenseman. And Leopold here. was new to the league at the time, just like, I mean, Raz only played here. The reason I think Hannafin more than anybody is Hannafin's been in a team where he was the number one guy. Yeah. And I think that there was different pressures there. And coming to Calgary, where he's arguably the number three or four guy, I think it's very different. I think, you know, a guy like that who's still very young needs some extra work to learn a new role yeah. and figure out who he is and, and what he should be. Yeah, and I think that all four of the young guys, Valimaki, Shillington, Hannafin, and Anderson, will develop a lot more under Daryl than I if they were just left to as they are. So it, it's a, I think it's going to be a huge thing for the Flames' defense core moving forward that Daryl, because uh, they're at that right age, like they're all 23 or under, or 24 or under, and you know like that's perfect for those you know to hey this is how you get to be robin regeer or you know drew doughty or whatever you know these these are the steps you need to take so it's, and, and you talked about kachuk and bennett up front and i think another guy in there just because daryl also has some familiarity i think we're really going to see what we've got out of michael backland i can see michael backland really being thrust back into the number two center spot and Lindholm be moved to right wing. And I think that Daryl's going to put a lot on Backland. Well, Daryl, one of the, the keys that he always emphasized in his usage of players was the smart players play the most. And for the defense, like both ends of the ice, Backland is probably the single best player on the team. Uh, he's one of the best defensive centers in the entire NHL. Like, he was in the top five for the Selkie last year. And he's consistently one of the best two-way players in the league. So, yeah, Backlund, to me, is the linchpin of, frankly, the whole defensive aspect of the forward group. And I think that another player that's going to similarly get a huge bump in his usage will be Derek Ryan. Yeah, I can see that. I don't know if they'll re-sign Ryan, but I think he'll get a lot of use this year. Uh, I could even see them bringing him, like, depending on how the rest of the season goes, I could see them bringing him back for another year or two, just, like, if presuming that he plays like Derek Ryan, like, for the rest of the season, like, just because of the fact that he's a very smart player that you can play on center or the wings, and that just that level of versatility is key there. I think Luch is probably going to get some more looks than maybe he has in different situations, but I don't know that it's going to last. I don't know that he's going to be able to rise to the occasion, but he's played with Daryl. Daryl knows the player, and I think that he might look to Luch each for some situations he hasn't yet. Well, I think that Luch each is just going to be, hey, you know, you see that guy over there? He's looking like he needs it to be woken up by a hit. Luch... Have fun. <laughs> I, I can just see I can see him putting Luch out in some situations with either Goudreau Monahan or Kachuk Lindholm if he feels that they need yeah. some muscle in those lines. That's what I mean by yeah. getting some other scenarios. I don't think he's gonna be a top no. two line guy all season, but I can see it being, hey, we're down to the last five minutes here. You go out and dig that puck out and and send it to one of those guys. Yeah, exactly. And 
in a lot of ways, like, Lucic is, like, the, this iteration's Chris Simon, where that big guy who can just, you know, have fun in the corners and just relentlessly forecheck, and, yeah, it's, yeah, I, I could see him being used in all sorts of different ways, and, like, what you're describing, it would be an effective usage of him. Who do you think might suffer from the Daryl Sutter transition? Um, Who do you think maybe isn't going to look as good or might have some hard time adjusting? Oh, uh, honestly, um, there, there's not really... It's one of those situations where like, you never really know how anybody's going to respond, but just based off of the evidence of like the Bill Peters first season that like everybody got a little better under bill peters and i you know like even a guy like who's more on the passive side like monahan played better under bill peters and i think that daryl's such a good teacher that like he knows that like say a guy like monahan who is passive okay but how do we make you better overall doing the thing that you do and I I don't really know unless somebody specifically has like a significant objection like I don't know if there's anybody who's going to take a significant step back it, I think it might just come down to usage more than anything and like say like a guy like Dylan Dubé might get used less just due to factors or not it it it's random, really. Like I think a, if we look at it numbers-wise, I think Dubé and Mangiapane might both take it because I think they will be rotated among that second-line spot. Yeah. And I think that there's still, even when I watch them, there's definitely some potential there. But they also both still have some bad habits. And I think that you'll see it be like, okay, Dylan, you didn't do X. Now, you know, Andrew's going to get that spot. And I think that Daryl still wants to shape those players into who they need to be. And I think that you might see their production go down while they're trying to learn to be different. Yeah, in, and I would in say a lot Backlund of ways, was the same way in his early career, right? We thought yeah. he could be a sniper, and he wasn't, and everyone got frustrated with him until he found his role as a two-way defenseman. Yeah, and I think that because uh, both Dubé and Mangiapane are two of the forwards, frankly, that have the most raw speed, that I think that they might be used more in uh, that. You know, somebody dumps it in. Th those guys were in uh, at, on it to try and get the puck, that kind of uh, type. And, you know, like, neither one of them has a lot of size, but they both are engaging physically. And I think that it, you're going to see Sutter try to maximize that uh, type of play in them and see how, like, they shake out. As I mentioned to you earlier, I think if uh, if we see Sam Bennett regress to the Sam Bennett of last year, he's really going to struggle with Daryl. I think he'll be in the press box faster than you can say, you know, Peter Marr broadcast booth because Sutter's not going to put up with, with uh, you know, stupid penalties. No, and to Sam Bennett's credit, he's actually been really good with the penalties this year. He has learned a, a, a good portion of, you know, keeping that kind of stuff at bay. So, you know, good on him. Uh, if I was Sam Bennett, I would be like, okay, Daryl, what are you telling me? And I'm going to listen as intently, take notes, <laughs> re-go over everything, and, you know, absorb everything, and, you know, try to apply everything that Daryl says. Because Daryl does know Sam Bennett's type of player, and how to fix the hangups that he has. And, like, literally, if anybody in the NHL could get Sam Bennett to unlock himself, it would be Daryl Sutter. It would be Daryl. Yeah. Yeah, but it, it's up to Sam how much of that he takes forward. Exactly. And from this point forward, it is on Sam Bennett. Like, you know, like, yeah, his usage to this point hasn't been great. You know, it's hard to produce when you're with guys like Jankowski and... Troy Brower and James. I Neal. think Daryl's going to give him enough rope, as they say, to hang himself. I think he'll get a lot of a lot of time over the next week to show what he is, and then if he doesn't pan out, I don't think Daryl's going to keep giving him chances. 
No, exactly. And, you know, and this is where you learn, like, is Sam Bennett legitimately a top six forward? Which he does have the potential to be. And, or is he basically this generation's Rafi Torres-ish type guy Ooh. that can be a chippy force on the third and fourth line, bounce around the league, and just be that kind of annoying guy who elevates occasionally in the playoffs, but is just the filler guy. And Torres was that kind of guy. He, he did have a reputation for being dirty that Bennett doesn't. But just that same edge where, like, a 20, 25, 30-point guy, that's just there. And, you know, that that's where Sam Bennett, is, his potential is right now, as he is now. He does have the potential to be more. That's up on Sam Bennett, though, to see if he can be more than basically a Rafi Torres I think another guy that might struggle a little bit this season would be Yusuf Alamaki because I think that Daryl's going to try and utilize you so differently than maybe he wants to be utilized or thinks he should be. And I think that that might, you might just see Yusuf struggle a little bit as he learns a different role or a different way of being. Yeah, but frankly, if any of them's going to learn on the fly, the guy I would expect to be able to be most versatile would actually be Yusuf Valimaki, just because... I think Yusuf will come out the other end looking better for it, but I think him, Dubé, and Manjapani all might have a bit of a struggle as they adapt to new expectations. Yeah, but that that's also fine. Like, they're all very young, too, so, like, that's a good thing. Well, I mean, it's fine that they're young, but all at the same time, somebody's got to produce if you're going to go to the playoffs, right? True, and... So there's some time for growing pains, but there's also not. Yeah, and uh, frankly, the the three guys you mentioned, I think are three of the most capable of learning how to do that and overcome and, you know, increase expectations and actually meeting them, uh, where, you know, some other people, eh, not so much. And another guy I think will struggle here is a guy I was quite high on when he came in, and that was Josh Levo. We haven't seen a lot from Levo, and I'm not sure that... I just don't know that he's going to get the shots that uh, that we think he is, and I don't think he's used to playing for a coach like Daryl. I mean, he's played a lot in Vancouver, Toronto, none of whom, when he was there, really had, um, really had such tough coaches. There were a lot of players' coaches when he was in the Marlies and with Vancouver, so I think he might struggle under this. And, I mean, all the tweeners are going to look like tweeners again, but I think you might notice Levo not in the lineup more than he has been. Yeah, and like, uh, as we I mentioned earlier, like, you have a guy like Adam Ruzitska who's playing very well in Stockton, and he's six foot four, and he can skate, and he hits. So, it's one of those where, you know, like, you are having upward pressure from down below, and if guys aren't showing themselves in practice, like, th there's, like, seven or eight guys that are the tweener cast up here, that if you're not performing, like, there's a guy who has size, can hit, and can score, who's ready, basically, for the NHL. So, like, you could lose your job if you're not, you know, and... Daryl's more than happy to bring a guy like Ruzitska up because, hey, size, yay. <laughs> I think even more than bringing a guy like, you know, Ruzitska up, I think he's going to lean hard on the guys he's got. And if, let's say, you know, Levo's not doing it, I think he might put more pressure on a guy like Nordstrom to fill that role. And I think he's going to try and solve the issue internally first because that's what Daryl seems to like to do. Yeah. And I think, and I think that... I think a guy like Nordstrom we could see more out of because I think he might get a little more time. Nordstrom uh, seems like more of a Daryl Sutter type Yeah, I to agree. Me. I agree. So, Matt, you mentioned earlier Daryl's three-year contract, right? Not just a solve for this year, three years in this deal. Do you think he stays here for all three? I mean, yes. would, Tr Tree seems to like to get rid of coaches. He changed coaches more than he changed underwear. Well, the thing, uh, frankly, since Daryl Sutter, uh, you had uh, Jim Playfair, who, a rookie coach. You had Iron Mike Keenan, who was at the end of his career, really. Um, Brent Sutter, uh, again, rookie coach. Then, uh, who else after that? Yeah, a bunch of, yeah. <laughs> I can't even remember off the top of my head. I think uh, Hartley after. I have, I have the list here. Hold on. So you want to go since Daryl's first stint? Yeah. 
So after Daryl's first stint, we had Jim Playfair, then Aluminum Mike Keenan by that point. Yeah. Then Brent Sutter, Bob Hartley, yeah. Glenn okay. Gullitson, Bill Peters, Jeff Ward. Yeah, I wasn't sure if there was somebody between Brent and Bob, so... No, and before Daryl was Al McNeil. Yeah. So, um, you know, then you have uh, Bob Hartley, who was pretty much the only legit coach out of the bunch, who was still, like, in the middle of his career. And he also had the best results based on the talent level of the team of any of the coaches. Then you, you went with a guy who's only had one season of coaching experience in Glenn Gullitson. Then Bill Peters, again, only one stop previous. Then uh, Jeff Ward, no coaching experience. So, like, frankly, like, this team hasn't had, like, a veteran good coach since Daryl Sutter. Well, I mean, of these guys, Jim Jim Playfair, I think we can agree, is a career assistant. And a great career assistant. There's some guys that are good at being assistants. Jeff Glenn Ward. Gullitson, I think Gullitson, Ward, they're all great assistant coaches. And sometimes you see the assistant that becomes a head coach, but I think the Flames have tried to force that a little too many times. I was excited when they brought Keenan in, because Keenan is a very winning coach, but Keenan was past his, his good coaching days at that point. Yeah, his methods just did not work with that era of hockey, and it, it just wasn't a good fit. And, you know, like the very stupid decision of playing Anders Erickson in the playoffs, you know, for and example. And then Brent Sutter, <laughs> I mean, we got to remember that Daryl hired his brother on that one. Yeah. Which, you um, know, to be fair, uh, Brent was a good juniors coach. It just, again, another inexperienced coach with no NHL experience, and I, I don't think he's coached at the NHL level since. So, you know, it, and, uh, yeah, familial things aside, like, he was a good juniors coach, but just not at the NHL level. And then after Hartley, like, it was just nothing but young and inexperienced guys so it like in a way it makes sense that the team has struggled with their coaching and had to continually change coaches because in like since 2006 15 years they've had one guy who actually was a an average or better nhl head coach I still don't think that the issue is coaching. I still think the issue is motivation on the ice. But I think Daryl's the guy that's going to um, be hard on these guys and get what we need out of them or know to ship out. Well, that that's part of what I'm trying to get at, though, is that with these young, inexperienced coaches or, like, Mike Keenan being past his prime, it, they don't know how to manage guys in the NHL. And... I think that, well, except for Bill Peters, who did actually do well, but, and frankly... Bill I, Peters came from another NHL team. Yeah, like, it, I think, frankly, if it wasn't for the whole racism thing, that Bill Peters is probably still our coach right now, but um, it's one of those things, though, that, like, the, you don't have anybody who, in recent history who knows how to properly motivate players bob hartley did and in 1415 that's why they went to the second round it now you have somebody in daryl who knows how to actually manage a locker room how to get the best out of players and get them all on the same page and i think that's going to be the first major departure from everything that has been you finally paid a coach who knows how to coach and you ponied up, and you got a good one. Like, frankly, Daryl is probably in the top three in the NHL for being that motivating type guy. Like, Tortorella and him pretty much are one-two in that manner. So, you know, it's a first, really, since Daryl last coached the Calgary Flames that they've had a guy that knows how to reach in to the players and get what they are out of them. So, Matt, if you're bringing in, and, and I mean, we won't have the debate, but one could argue that Daryl Sutter's past his prime as well. I mean, he's retired. He's been on league for a while. 
I don't know that he's the long-term solution, but when I look at this, I say, what a great guy to learn from, not only for the players, but also for the coaching staff. And I wonder if you see them find the next Gullitson, the next Ward, the next hot assistant or junior coach, and bring them up as an associate coach, sort of to be primed to take over from Daryl. Almost like how uh, Jay Feaster was here, primed to take over the GM job when he was here. And I, and I think this could be a great time to start grooming the next guy. Because Calgary seems to fire their guy and find somebody out of nowhere, whether that's someone in the organization like Ryan Huska, or well, whether somebody outside the organization like Tim Hunter, I wonder if now is the time to, and maybe not mid-season, but in the off-season, time to really look at that coaching staff and find your heir apparent. Yeah, and I think that while one of them is here with Huska, I think that I would not be surprised if after Daryl that will, will be the Flames' next head coach. But uh, it's one of those things that, I think that the team is going to need to do an exhaustive search for the next good young guy and bring him in as an associate coach, as you mentioned. And we'll see. Like There are plenty of options out there, as always, and they just have to do their due diligence. And they have pretty much nearly a calendar year to do that. So, you know, it's... I. I don't know that you see Daryl here for all three years. I think you see him here this year and next year, and I think if they can find the heir apparent, I can see them shifting Daryl into some sort of an advisory role for the third year or um, some special assistant role to the head coach, something like that. But I think I just think that he could burn this roster out if, if it's the Daryl Sutter that we know and what he's looking for. But I, I think that this is the time to make some changes. And as you said, you've now got somebody who has NHL experience and Stanley Cup experience. And I think more than anything, it's tough to coach a team to Stanley Cup if you've never been there and don't know what it takes. And that's been the issue with a lot of these guys. Gullitson, I mean, Ward's been there, but not as a head coach. It's hard to follow someone who's never done it. Yeah, exactly. And um, thankfully, like you have guys like Lucic who have gone to the Stanley Cup Finals and won. And a few players that have more experience being in winning franchises and such. And we'll see. You know, like everything, it just depends on the guys in the room. And, you know, uh, I'm hopeful that uh, Daryl does enough where he can start to get everybody working on the same page. And, you know... Like, frankly, these, like, skipping 20 to 40 minutes of hockey that the Flames have been doing this season, I think that'll be the first thing that goes away. And we'll see how everything else shakes out. Because, like, it, there are too many question marks with this team right now. But as you and I said, there's only so much you can fix in a half season as well. So this season is what it is. I mean, we'd like to see them make the playoffs, but we're going to get out of this team what we get out of this team at this point. And I think the the thing is looking for the right people for next year. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and like to me, like this is just a like a thirty game audition to see who are the going to be the twenty players for next year, like and make your alterations based off of that and. We'll see. You know, we've and- we've seen the same coaching staff going back to that for a few coaches here now, and we saw this in Daryl's era too. I remember there was a time I think it was before Brent that he had all the assistant coaches hired, but no head coach. And I think that Daryl might be the kind of guy like Ray Edwards was kind of pushed into the job last year because we needed a body. But I don't know that he's he wants to be in that role or if the organization wants him in that role. So I think Daryl might be the guy who comes in as well. And I mean, I don't know that Glenn Gullitson or uh, Jeff Ward were the guys you want building a coaching staff, right? They've been assistants. But I think J- Daryl's legacy here could be putting together the right coaching staff for the next guy. True. You know, whether that's Huska, whether that's Jelena, whether that's whoever, I don't know. I mean, I'm not convinced that Jelena is a long-term assistant coach on a team. I think he's around because the organization likes him, and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, but I, I just I think Daryl could be the guy to bring in that, like I said, that hot associate coach and revamp the rest of the coaching and leave the organization in a better position than he found it that way. Yeah, I agree. And it's one of those things that I think a lot of the internal problems that this team 
has, frankly, that uh, over the next while are going to get sorted out. And that, that to me, is the biggest positive out of all of this. Like, to me, like, for, frankly, for the rest of this season, it is what it is. Like, either the Flames are going to make the playoffs or they're not, and the players are going to respond or they're not. And you'll see moves made accordingly based on level of buy-in and all of that. Like, you know, frankly, if everybody does get on the same page and they're pulling in that same direction, then, you know, Calgary might actually be still the team that we were kind of hoping that they would be before the season started. Or they're not, and then certain players are going to get traded, and or you know, left via free agency or whatever methods needed. I, I look at this as boot camp now. You've got the drill sergeant in place, and it's going to be who wants to put up with... You know, I mean, in the military, they use boot camp as a way to weed out the guys that don't want to be there. And I look at this hockey boot camp. You've got your drill sergeant. It's a matter of seeing who wants to do this and who doesn't want to do this. Yep. And both are fine. You know, it, it, that, that's We just a, need to know. Yeah, like, that. this is the good way of sorting. You know, like, if you're not wanting to put in that effort, that's great. Fine. You can go do that for some other team, and that's fine. And, you know, because you'll have enough talent that we can trade you, or we'll just, you know... I mean, I know I wouldn't do well in military boot camp. I wouldn't survive it, but I'd be a productive member of society, and I am in other fields. Yeah, exactly. And, you know... if the this team has the buy-in, like you already know, Kachuk's and Lucic and a handful of others are already bought in. They were bought in before. That you know, like if you can get others to maybe find that inner strength to go that way, great. If not, that's fine. You know, there are other players on other teams, and that's you know, well. Either free agency or trade, we will address that situation when it comes up. And, you know, like, it, it, to me, like, this is the best single move for the logo on the front that the Flames have made probably in the last eight or nine years. I heard somebody say that hiring Daryl is the best move the Flames have made since hiring Daryl. Pretty much, yeah. And it's because of the fact that he will sort out all the problems and then they can be worked on. And, like, it's sort of like last year. It was apparent we needed a goaltender and to tweak the defense score. So the the Flames went out and they got the goaltender and they tweaked the defense score. So now, you know, Daryl's just going to be the catalyst to figure out, okay, now what the hell do we need to do to fix this? <laughs> Daryl's here to win. Daryl's made it abundantly clear that he's here to win, and I think his message is pretty much going to be, I'm here to win. If you're not, you know, we're going to find that out, and we're going to move you on somewhere else. But if you're here to win, you know, we'll win together. And going back to that question about, you know, how long will Daryl be here, I think if the Flames can sip from Lord Stanley's mug next year, he retires after that. Like, I think, you know, he wants to get a cup in the three years, and if he does before that, I think he'll ride off into the sunset. He's already said he has unfinished business here, and I think that'd be a great end to his career, is win a cup in Calgary and then drive back up to Viking. Yep. Never to be heard from again. Yeah. Well, the thing is, is that, frankly, like, the Flames, despite everything this season, they could win the cup. They do have the talent there. Like, it didn't just... Gotta make the playoffs first, man. Let's focus on that. No, I know that. Like, the talent is there. If you can actually get everybody on the same page and pulling in the same direction, they do have that in them to do that. It's just, do you actually have the buy-in from the players? And we'll see. Like, it, it, this will be just an interesting last couple months of the season just to see, you know, who does what. How is so-and-so going to respond? You know, how are the lineups going to be changed? Are there going to be moves during the season? What are the needs of the team? Like, th- there are so many fascinating storylines to come up, and, like, I'm excited just to see how things unfold from game to game now. 
where it's it like makes, it makes the journey much more interesting yeah because uh, like as fans we get to enjoy just seeing it, it's sort of like a watching a good tv show now like where it, now it's seeing like oh what parts are going to do what and like how is the story going to evolve and you know all that kind of stuff like it's in, intriguing instead of like oh great the flames are losing again Ho, well, we have um, a senators game to go watch so i don't want to keep us too much longer we can expo- we can uh, talk more about daryl next year but quick yes or no question for you do you think daryl will make the coaching decision you would make every year if you were coach is he going to convert a, f- a defenseman to forward <laughs> every year he wants to convert one of our d-men to forward Hey, Oliver, we need a right winger. <laughs> Lace him up. <laughs> uh, you just no. finished expunging the you know the depth of our farm core. Are you going to well, move a defense up to forward before you do that? No, I, I think that, um, frankly, part of it was uh, the lack of like offensive skill from the farm system Like after graduating so many guys and you know having too many defensemen. But I think... Uh, now that you're seeing guys like Pedersen and Ruzitska and Phillips doing well in Stockton, that you know you have enough where, where if you need that skill guy, period, you got guys on the farm to go do that. Where you know before then, like last season, you had a very young Matthew Phillips who was also banged up, and that was basically it. So you know where so long and short of it is no, no. It, I'm always intrigued by that idea just because it's hard to teach skill and the offensive instincts. So, like, a guy like Shillington, who, like, if he can't figure out the uh, the defensive side of it, he still could be a good offensive player. So, it's one of those, like, do you actually explore that? Because you don't want to see a talent get wasted when, like, there is the na- just natural offensive skill there. So that I I always hate wasting when you have somebody with talent seeing that get wasted. Well, Matt, we got about fifteen minutes here till the Ottawa game starts. So let's wrap this up here. Daryl Sutter joins the team tomorrow on uh, Monday the eighth. The Flames have three days off, the eighth, ninth, tenth, to get acquainted to Daryl, and then they will play uh, two games this week. So they have tonight's game, then they have a game on Thursday against Montreal in the Dome, 7 p.m. start, and they're early on the Hockey Night in Canada games this Sunday, this Saturday, a 5 p.m. against Montreal. Three games this week. I have a feeling that you, thinking that Daryl's the savior for this team, think that we're going to get all three wins. Am I right? Uh, I'm predictable to an extent and but yeah i think that um it's more that um i think that what you're going to see more is fear (laughs) from the flames players so it's like i really have to try especially after losing that edmonton game like oh boy i do not need that (laughs) so uh yeah no daryl please don't hurt me (laughs) so i think you're gonna see the flames play a lot better overall and sure i'll throw the three win prediction just because you said so (laughs) um i and again we don't have time to debate this we can talk more about next week but i'm not convinced daryl's a savior for this team i think he's definitely going to help things this year but i'm not sure how we go forward with it after this and i think there's going to be some tough sledding ahead as daryl takes over and uh, and transitions into the head coaching role. I think tonight against Ottawa, they're going to lose. I think they're, they're going to come in playing Edmonton, and they're going to try hard, but they usually play a level of their opponents and don't win. So I'm going to say that they're going to lose. I think they'll win the first game against um, Montreal with Daryl behind the bench, and I think they're going to lose Hockey Night in Canada. Oh, yeah. So I'm going to go with two losses and a win for this week. And, boy, I would not want to be – on the practice rink if you, what you say happens like oh man <laughs> well if they lose tonight they got three days to deal with the wrath of daryl sutter yeah especially after he told them to win both like if they lose both oh boy you're gonna get daryl sutter 101 really really quick <laughs> really quick. we want to we want to know what everyone else thinks about the daryl sutter signing you're like matt do you think this is the best thing to happen to the flames since daryl sutter um do you think that maybe daryl sutter is 
past his prime and can't coach in this league anymore? Do you think something else? Let us know. Let us know on Twitter. We're at Fireside Podcast. On Facebook, we're Fireside Chat or Facebook.com slash Fireside Chat. On uh, on Instagram, you can get a hold of us. We're Fireside Chat underscore podcast. We post there sometimes. You can always comment on our website on this episode at firesidechat.ca or send us a text message at 587 200 7176. Again, that's 587 587- Two zero zero seven one seven six. Fire us a text and let us know what you think, um, or through the contact form on our website at firesidechat.ca. But I think this is going to be a very polarizing decision, the Daryl Sutter decision. So I'm curious to hear what what the Sea of Red thinks on this one. Matt, let's get ready to go watch the Senators game and watch take us out as always. Well, as always, go Flames, go! And now I'm looking forward to hearing it in Game One of the playoffs. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.